two, let's all stand on up. Let's worship our God here this morning. Come on.
amazing it is to be able to give back to God, to worship Him with the, the very breath in our lungs that He's blessed us with. One of my favorite Bible verses is right here in our passage today. It's verse 19. It says, this hope we have is an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast. You see, we go through difficult times in life. Maybe it's a medical diagnosis or a financial hardship, marital issues, whatever these things may be for us. It always eventually reaches that, that point where we just can't do it on our own. And maybe today, maybe this morning, you'll be reminded that we have an anchor, not just for the calm sea, seas, but for the storms of this life. And because of that anchor of hope, we can trust that he works all things for good. We can trust that he is a way maker and that he keeps his promises. Stop. 
stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you work things that everyone in this room is, uh, is dealing with, the, uh, the hardships, the issues, the, uh, the anxieties, the fears that we're all dealing with, but God, you know, we're praying for you to reach out um, into those situations. God, for some of us, we're, we're praying for a miracle. We're, uh, we're praying for you to turn the tides. God, we believe that you are a way maker, that you work miracles, and that you keep your promises for us. God, we thank you for who you are, for the love that you just continue to show us every single day. God, would you just reveal more of your goodness, more of who you are to us here this morning as we dive into your word. It's in Jesus' name that we all pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper. When you sing that word, you are singing the truth of Hebrews chapter 6. In fact, if you ask somebody, how do you know that God is a promise keeper? Right, we kept singing, that is who you are. They could point you to Hebrews chapter 6. It's going to use the word promise four times. Describing how our God keeps his promises to us. Because that is who he is. And if you remember the, the audience that the author of Hebrews is writing to, they need to know that. Like they need to know what God's promises are. They need to know that God keeps his promises. Because they've heard about this Jesus. This man who was God come to earth to pay the price for their sins, their inability to keep the law, to rescue them and give them eternal life. And they've said, I believe it. But they're facing persecution from the outside. They're being ostracized from their own families. People who can't believe you're buying into that Jesus stuff. And it makes them question and wonder, like, am I really going to put all of my eggs in the basket of that craftsman from Galilee? Because if so, if he really is who he says he is, 
If God's promises really come through him, I want to know what those promises are, and I want to know that he's going to keep them. Because there are times that it's hard. There are times that it's costly. There are times that it's difficult to know and to feel if those promises are true. And so we saw just last week in the beginning of that chapter a very stern warning not to fall away from who Jesus is, from the promises that he's making. And you can feel the heart of the author as he's writing this. As we continue in chapter 6 today and he lays out his, his piece of parchment or maybe it's papyrus picks up his quill, or it may have been a, a reed split at the end to hold ink. And he writes to them right after that warning as he continues in verse 9. And it's not on the screen, but pull it up, follow with me, and, and watch for the words of encouragement he wants them to hear. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so, after he, Abraham, had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For indeed, men swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute. Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise, the immutability, big word for it, it can't change, the immutability of his counsel, he confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor. An anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us. Even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to to the order of Melchizedek. How about that? Is that encouraging? You just want it to keep going, right? And, and you realize that, that after the passage we saw last week and the warning of the weight of it, and, and he gives them all these like scary words. He says last week, impossible, fall away, shame, rejected, cursed, burned. Yeah, that is a weighty warning and a serious one. Right, That diligence in Christ matters, and, and it feels like it's, if you put it on a scale like this, like it is weighing us down. But did you catch the words of encouragement in this passage? Because right away in verse 9 he says, Beloved, we're confident of better things concerning you. So just like we talked about last week, God doesn't want us to feel insecurity. He wants us to be secure in his promises. And that's why you really have to take chapter 6 as a whole. All of this stuff about moving on from milk to meat, this, this dangerous warning not to go backwards, is followed by verses 9 through 20 of just this incredible encouragement of better things. Now we've used that word better a lot in this series so far, but it's actually only the second time we've seen it in the text. The first time was about Jesus. This second one is for us. That because Jesus is better, the writer is confident of better things for us. He says that they're things that accompany salvation. So he's not wondering if they're saved or not. He knows that because they are, because they're seeing fruit, 
that even though he speaks in this manner of warning, he knows that God is not unjust to forget their work and labor of love, which have shown toward his name, that they have ministered to the saints and do minister. He's saying, you guys are living it out. I've seen your salvation at work. I know you're bearing fruit. I know it's hard. I know you have ups and downs. But I know there are better things in store for you. And I love that he says he is confident of those better things. Not a wait and see. He says confident. And so as we went through those verses, I want you to hear all of the words of confidence that God is speaking to you. He says confident, full assurance, promises, promise, swear, swore, surely, promise, swear, oath, confirmation, promise, immutability, confirmed, oath, immutable, impossible for God to lie, strong consolation, refuge, anchor, sure, steadfast, forever. And all of those that so greatly outweigh the insecurity we might have are how the Bible defines hope. That is where we find the full assurance of hope. Now this has been a pretty good week for me in terms of sports, professional sports. I, I, I'll explain later, but I'm a Chicago Bulls fan, die hard, and a Buffalo Bills fan, <laughs> die hard. So we just signed Josh Allen to a new six-year deal. He's going to be our quarterback through 2028, and I'm hoping we win the Super Bowl. And the Bulls just uh, with all apologies to the other players, but we dropped a lot of dead weight this week and signed Lonzo Ball, which is kind of a wait and see, but we also got other players who are going to, like DeMar DeRozan, I think give us a chance, I'm hoping, to win the championship. But you see what I just did there? I said, I'm hoping we win the Super Bowl and I'm hoping we win the championship. Which means, who knows if we will or not, right? I'm hoping we do. Right? That's the way we usually use the word hope. Well, I hope so. It almost always, when we use it, means that it's uncertain. The way the Bible uses it is the exact opposite of that. The word hope is not a thing that we'll have to wait and see if it really happens or not. When the Bible uses the word hope, it is confident, it is steadfast, it is sure, it is an anchor, it is a promise, it is an oath that God swears. Hope is for certain. That's why we don't say, I hope so. We say, I have hope. See, and that's what the writer of Hebrews wants to give to us here. Look at verses 11 and 12. He says, we desire, right? This is his heart for his readers, and that includes you. All right, you're reading Hebrews today. This is his desire for you, that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So would you hear this? Full assurance of hope, absolute confidence, is not only what the author of Hebrews wants for you. This is God's desire for you full assurance of hope. And so we're going to kind of ask ourselves three questions today to just sort of help us self-identify. Am I living in light of that assurance? Because here he says that we're going to inherit the promises. Well, how do we do that? We've got the full assurance of hope through faith and patience. And, and the sense of patience here is, is not quite like um, I'm trying to be patient with my kids, or sometimes you're forced to be patient in traffic. It's more like endurance. So is your faith marked by assurance and patience that we are able to wait on God, trusting in the fulfillment of his promises? Do I have a back and forth I feel good today, but not yesterday, or yesterday was good, but I don't know about today, or do we have assurance because of the promises of Jesus Christ? Now, I've wrestled with this a lot in my own life, and as I've processed this as an adult, I realize I sort of let it in as a kid, that like, I know that I put my faith in Christ when I was very little, 
and, and you'll hear me when I tell my story, some of you probably heard me use this line, that there is a lot of life and a lot of temptation that you have not seen when you're six years old. And I remember thinking, like, as I was growing, there would be times where I would sneak off by myself and, like, say the prayer again. Dear Jesus, please save me. Just in case. Like, just in case I didn't say it right the first time or it didn't stick the first time or I've messed up too much since the last time. And, and I sort of always knew that that's, like, that's not really how it works. But there was this insecurity in me that felt like, like somehow I was going to make it secure by saying it one more time or saying it better or meaning it more this time or, or something. You know, and obviously you can see right through that right away, right? That, that falls apart instantly. Like, how, how could I ever know if I meant it enough or, or whatever it was? And the question really was, do I know that I'm a sinner? Have I confessed that to Jesus and that I believe he's the only one that forgives me and that I accept it from him? Right? I mean, in many ways, it's just that simple. Not because, like, like a prayer is not magic words. Right? It's, it's my belief in Christ. It's him that saves me. But I realized because I'd sort of built that pattern into my brain, there were times even as an adult that I wrestled with this. And I remember where I was sitting on the back porch of our home. This was, this was when we uh, actually were living in Kentucky for a couple of years. Just a beautiful spot where the sun would rise behind the hills on this side and set behind the hills on that side. And I'm sitting there and I'm on the phone with my mentor, Ray, and I'm just telling him that I'm struggling with this. And it's like, I know better, but I'm not feeling it. <laughs> And I, I love that we were just singing, like, even when I don't feel it, he's working. And I will never forget what Ray said to me on the other end of the phone that day, because I, I was telling him, like, Ray, I know I shouldn't be, like, thinking this way, and I know that I, I get tripped up by this sometimes, but it shakes me, and then it's like, now I feel more distant from God, and I don't feel as useful to him, and all these things that start to come when I let insecurity in like that. I don't know, like, I, I know it's true, but I'm just not feeling it. And the thing he said was, Drew, it's not a feeling. It's a promise. I was like, I had nothing else to say on the phone call that day. Because <laughs> that's just it. Like, that's where our assurance comes from. Like, if Jesus' ability to save me and hold me secure for eternity was based on how I'm feeling today, <laughs> or how I'm feeling this afternoon, then like, yesterday I was saved because I felt so good and I was singing at Horizon and it was great and then but today, man, like, I don't know, I'm feeling a little doubtful. I got questions, and I'm not so sure about some of this, and I made a mistake. And like, How weak would Jesus have to be for my feelings to undo his promise? But it's not a feeling. It's a promise that our faith is marked by assurance, not because of me, but because of Jesus. And that when my faith is marked by assurance, then I wait on the Lord then I trust that his promises are true and that he will fulfill them. And so the writer of Hebrews is telling us he wants us to imitate people who through faith and patience inherit the promises. People who live that confidence in Christ out. And then he gives them this perfect example in verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham. Now remember, his audience is, is Jewish. And for centuries, for millennia, their confidence has been in Abraham. Like if you actually go back to the Gospels, when John the Baptist shows up, he has to specifically tell people, don't think that because you have Abraham as your father that you're good to go. Right? Just because you're from his bloodline doesn't mean you're saved. You need a personal relationship with God, and I'm going to point you to the Messiah. So for the author of Hebrews, he knows right where to start. If, if for any reason your confidence is in Abraham, well, let's talk about Abraham. For when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now, I love this, because when, when people make an oath, right? I mean, how many times have we heard someone say, I swear to God? Like, they're trying to convince you that what they just said is really tr true, and it's like, do you or are you taking his name in vain right now? I'm not even totally sure how to process this and I'm, I still don't believe you, <laughs> right? And God is basically saying, I swear to me, right? Like that by the very fact that he is God, whatever he says is instantly true and it is instantly guaranteed. And in case you doubted it, he reminds you he's God by taking an oath by himself. 
Because I am God, I am telling you, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. And I love this because what you see here is God says I will bless you. God says I will multiply you. What does Abraham do? Believe him and wait for it. Abraham, Father Abraham, uh, the father of their entire religion, who all of them are looking back to, didn't earn this thing, didn't bargain with God, didn't work his way into it, didn't prove he was worth it. God made a promise. Abraham believed him and waited for it. See, that's the model that he's giving us to follow. And, and what's really interesting about this, that quote, surely blessing I will bless you, he's actually thinking of Genesis 22. In fact, if you go to Genesis 22, verses 16 to 18, it says, literally, God says to him, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed." Because you have obeyed my voice. He's taking it exactly out of one of the most critical moments in Abraham's life. This is our Bible study tool. Use the Bible to define the Bible. Because think about it. The Jewish audience knows everything about Abraham. Ah, Abraham, we love that guy. I'm from Abraham. This is great. Right? They know his life. They know where this comes from. In fact... If you go through Abraham's life, what's amazing about this, when you think about the patience that it takes, Genesis chapter 12, God makes a promise to Abraham. Genesis chapter 13, God repeats his promise to Abraham. Genesis chapter 14, Abraham meets Melchizedek. We'll come back to that next week. Genesis chapter 15, God affirms the promise again and demonstrates through a sacrifice that he alone will keep the promise. In fact, Genesis chapter 15 is when it says that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Guys, the entire New Testament uses Genesis 15 to demonstrate that we are saved by grace, not works. It points out that, because even Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Genesis 15. Genesis 16. Abraham and his wife become impatient for the promise and they try to accomplish it on their own. But he's already saved. He was already believed in accredited righteousness and And so even in the life of Abraham, there are these ups and downs because then it's it's messed up. Sarah sends her concubine. He gets the concubine pregnant. She gives birth to Ishmael. And people are still bombing each other today because they fight over whether the promise was Ishmael or Isaac. Like there are severe consequences sometimes to not patiently enduring and waiting for God to fulfill his promise and instead trying to make it happen on your own. Trying to think that I keep God's promises. And yet in chapters 17 and 18, God confirms his promise again. And by chapter 21, like 20 years later, Isaac, the child of promise, is born. And then these words come from Genesis 22 when God tells Abraham to go sacrifice Isaac on a mountaintop. Is that not like a terrifying picture right there? Like, sometimes I feel like we get used to these Bible stories and you forget what's happening in this picture. That a father, obeying God, takes his son up the mountain to sacrifice his only son whom he loves. So we don't have time today for all of the nuances of Genesis 22. But here's what I want you to see. Because I think it's clear that that God knew he was not going to allow Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. That wasn't the point. In fact... Tiny spoiler alert, later in Hebrews, he's actually going to tell us that as Abraham walked up the mountain, he now was so confident of God's promise, so confident that it was going to happen through Isaac, that he believed even if God actually let him go all the way through with killing Isaac, still the promise has to come through Isaac, which means God's going to resurrect Isaac. That's actually what Abraham believed, which I kind of love that because the real story is, 
before he ever put the knife to Isaac, God stops his hand and provides a ram for the sacrifice, which was God's plan all along. Which just kind of shows me, for Abraham, it's like, he's right about the promise. He's not always right about exactly how it's going to come about. Doesn't that feel like us sometimes? Like, I know what God said, but I can't see how it's going to work out. Or I think it's going to work out this way. And he's actually doing something totally different and way better. Because here, here are the highlights, basically, of Genesis 22. You know that's the first chapter in the Bible where the word love shows up? When he says, take your only son whom you love. Same words we heard at Jesus' baptism. This is my son whom I love. You see, for all the weirdness of Genesis 22, what God is actually doing, remember we said that the whole Bible has been about Jesus the whole time? He's showing you that there's a heavenly father who is willing to sacrifice his only son, whom he loves. He's showing you that when a human being faces death and eternal consequence for sin, it is God who will provide the sacrifice that gives us life. That God provides the substitution. And then he repeats the promise to Abraham that all the nations of the earth will be blessed through your seed. That Isaac is just the foreshadowing of that one descendant, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the son that was sacrificed for us. Jesus is the substitution that was given for us. What that means is, you and I receive the same promise that Abraham received. When you and I believe God's promise, we are believing the same thing as Abraham. When the Bible encourages us in Hebrews 6 to patiently endure, it means that I have an absolute confidence that God is going to do what God said he is going to do. And in verses 16 to 18, he wants to explain exactly how different this is from our human interactions. Right? He says that men swear an oath of confirmation, and that's an end of a dispute. Like if something came up and you wanted to fight about it, hey, not only did you promise me, but we put up collateral, we signed a contract, whatever it is. Like we make oaths to try to prove I really meant what I said, where God can just say it. And the fact that he's God makes it stand. And yet, God wanted to show more abundantly. All he has to do is say it, but he wants us to really, 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 really be sure. So to show the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, he confirmed it by an oath. That by two immutable things, the character of God, right? The fact that he is God, and the fact that it's impossible for God to lie. We have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. There's something there about our response to God's promise. Do I flee for refuge? Do I run to God for refuge to lay hold of the hope? And that's our second question. Is your refuge in God's promise or in your performance? You see, for Abraham, just like us, he had ups and downs. That mess in chapter 16 is where Abraham starts to think his promise has something to do, his, his performance has something to do with God keeping promises. That there's some the way that he's got to work himself into it. You know, when we can find ourselves in that trap, yes, I believe Jesus is the Savior, but also I got to make sure that I'm doing the right thing to, to really have confidence that I'm saved. Like, that's, that's broken. You see, we get that backwards. We think that Sometimes we act as if I do good works, then God will save me. Like I'll show that I deserved it. Or I got to prove that I was worth it. But for God, it's the other way around. Through Jesus Christ, he saves me through his death and his resurrection. And then I get to do good works out of my love for him. Those don't save me. That's already a promise. I'm already sealed by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 1 and Ephesians 1. So instead of relying on my performance, I have security in God's promise. That's my refuge. When I'm doing well, but things don't go well, when my life feels like it's falling apart, when I make a mistake and I have to return to him for repentance, for confession, my refuge is not in my ability to make up for it. My refuge is in God's promise. 
That's why in verses 19 and 20, he kind of wraps this thing together by saying, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul. I love that phrase. This hope we have as an anchor. You can just feel the weight of it. Both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. Now, we'll come back to the idea that Jesus is forerunner, but let's talk about the anchor for a minute. Because what is the point of an anchor? Well, it's just what Hebrews has been saying, right? How many times has he said, don't drift, right? Don't float away from this Jesus thing that you've locked in on. That's what the anchor does. It keeps you from drifting. And because of this verse, the anchor became an incredibly important symbol for the early church. For brand new Christians who are trying to figure out what are those pieces we hang on to. And so you and I think about the cross, right? The cross is a symbol of our faith. There's a cross like, you know, straight up through here at the top of this building. That when you drive up and you say, is that a castle? I don't know. There's a cross on it. I think it's a church. Because the cross means there are people here who believe that their confidence is in Jesus. We hold that symbol. For the early church, the anchor was every bit as important. In fact, you can find catacombs throughout that part of the world, like the ones you see pictured here. Basically, they're like underground burial grounds. All of these tunnels dug under the earth and archways to hold them up. And we actually believe that Christians, early Christians, were hiding in these catacombs to hold worship services to avoid the persecution that was happening around them. So this one's actually from Malta, one of the places that Paul would have seen on his missionary journeys. But within these catacombs, in this one and many others, they find these inscriptions, these carvings of anchors. This one's from a catacomb called Domitia, and this carving is from the first century. Before you hit the year 100. That means these are people carving this into stone who lived at the same time as the disciples and the apostles. Like, at the same time as they're reading Hebrews, they're saying, man, anchor for the soul, where's my chisel? Put that thing in the rock. And and notice what they do here with this picture. You see the anchor is built out of a cross. Because when when Christ died for our sins on the cross, he paid the penalty for everything you have done, did today, could do in the future, and he said, it is finished. And he rose again to conquer sin and death so he can give us eternal life. The cross represents the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so they take the cross, draw it into an anchor, and then you get these two fish. They're not actually hooked. They're anchored. And the reason they use fish, like maybe you guys are used to this. You you ever see the Jesus fish like on the back of people's cars? You know why it's called the Jesus fish? This actually makes a lot of sense, but I never thought about this. It's because when Jesus shows up, you remember he tells Peter, I will make you a fisher of men. So essentially what he's telling him metaphorically is every time you catch somebody to the gospel, that person, that's another fish. Right? So Christians started to see themselves metaphorically, we're the fish. And we are hanging on to our anchor, to our cross, to the finished work of Christ. In fact, when you see the Jesus fish, the the, the cool thing about this for Greek speakers is they take that metaphor from Jesus, they identify themselves as the fish, but the Greek word for fish is ichthus, and so they turn that into an acronym for Jesu Christu Theu Huios Soter, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Doesn't quite work with the English word fish. (laughs) But that's why you see that. That's what the weird symbols you sometimes see inside it means, that they believe the anchor for their soul is Jesus Christ and none other. Son of God, the Savior. All coming right out of Hebrews 6, 19. And what I love about this picture is that when he tells them that this is where their anchor is, he compares it to how Jesus is the forerunner for us. You know, back in those verses, in in verse 20, it says that where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus. That's a big deal, because what he's talking about there when he says he's become a high priest forever, that he's entered the presence behind the veil. He's talking about the innermost part of the temple, the Holy of Holies behind the veil. 
which separated everybody else from coming in it because there was only one person only one time each year that could go into the Holy Holies. And that was the high priest. And once a year, on the Day of Atonement, he would go in not as a forerunner, but as a representative. Because he himself was a sinner. Along with all the people. They would confess their sin. He would go into the Holy of Holies to receive forgiveness, not only for himself, but as a representative for all of the people. Well, here's the problem. I mean, we've talked about Aaron as the first high priest. He would be the first to be going in the Holy of Holies when it was still in the tabernacle. And we know that he's a sinner. We heard about the golden calf. We know he's made mistakes, that he's broken God's law. And we know that nothing unholy can survive the presence of the holy God. So they get this fear, like, what if the high priest goes in there and he doesn't come out again? It's kind of funny. I mean, you think about it. If, if the high priest goes in there with some hidden sin, he'll drop dead before the Ark of the Covenant behind the veil in the Holy of Holies. And then they got to figure out, how do we get him out of there? Hey, you should probably go in and get the high priest. I'm not going in there. <laughs> I didn't honor my father and mother yesterday. I can't take that chance. Well, I'm not going in there. I was looking at my neighbor's wife. I can't take that chance. Well, I've been using uh, uneven weights. I'm sorry, guys, but I'm not going in there. So what they figure out is they actually tie a rope to his ankle with bells on it because then you can hear him if he's moving around, jingle, 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 jangle. And if it gets too quiet for too long, nobody has to go in there. I'm not risking it. I'm not going behind the veil. They can drag him out by the rope. Okay, here's the difference with Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is not just a representative. He's a forerunner. He's a trailblazer. And when he died on the cross, literally, the veil of the temple tore in two. Think how terrifying that would be if you are in the temple at that moment and the Holy of Holies is suddenly wide open to everybody and you're thinking, we're all going to die. Except that Jesus has provided the payment. Jesus has gone into the presence behind the veil as a forerunner that now anybody through Jesus, can go directly, without fear, boldly before the throne of grace in the very presence of God. That is the anchor of our souls. You know, when I think about anchors, I was hanging out with a couple buddies of mine. We're sitting at the barber shop, and I've got Andrew on one side and Nathan on the other. They're brothers. But this one's Coast Guard and this one's Navy, so I thought I'd better sit in between them. <laughs> and they're bragging about boats and they're bragging about time on the high seas. And, you know, and, and the interesting thing is I had no idea, like a, a, as they're bragging back and forth, because, of course, that's what we're talking about is boats. I had no idea how massive an aircraft carrier is. Like the amount of people on an aircraft carrier is like a small city. They have Starbucks on there, and there's a McDonald's on there. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Nathan's telling us about his boat. And I'm thinking, how on earth do you anchor a boat that big? Well, this is how. <laughs> that little red spot in the corner, can you see that? That's a human being. That's a grown man standing just behind this massive anchor. The chain alone has links that weigh 350 pounds each. There's something like 57 links in a shot, and there's 12 shots in the chain. All of that, plus the anchor itself, weighs 20 tons. To keep a boat that big from drifting, whether the seas are calm or stormy. Now, I actually have a boat, too. My, my grandparents have a place up on a lake in Minnesota, and we just have a nice kind of a little, little fishing boat, little John boat. I think the, I think the engine is about 9 horsepower so we're not pulling anything behind that boat this is my anchor you know what that is that's a paint can full of cement <laughs> the paint can rusted away because we keep dropping it in the water all you have left now is a a paint can looking cement block my anchor weighs about 20 pounds and guess what even if i stay in the bay on lake malax even if there's just like a little bit of a breeze when I drop the anchor, our boat goes like this. As I slowly 
get further from shore as we drift away because I've got a 20-pound anchor. So here's, here's the thing, guys. Do you want an anchor that's 20 pounds or 20 tons? Like, where is your hope anchored? Is it in your job? Is job security what makes life feel safe? Is it in your investments? Like, as long as they're growing, I feel secure. Is it in your health? Is it in your sense of approval from other people or how they treat you? Is your anchor your relationships, even your marriage? Are you making another person your anchor? Is it your physical appearance? Is it like I've wrestled with my feelings? If I feel forgiven, I feel anchored. But what if I don't feel it? Or is it Jesus? Because guys, all of those, those are 20 pound anchors. That's a paint can full of cement and you are going to drift if any of those things are what you're latching your security to. You know, just a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity with elders and, and a group leader and, and some friends and family that we were standing in the hearth room with a guy named Chris who attends here at Horizon. Young guy, but dealing with a painful degenerative disease. And so we were just gathering to, to anoint him, to pray with him, to lay hands on him. And as we're standing there, at the beginning, somebody says, hey, Chris, you know, we, we are praying for healing. And, and we did, but he stopped us and said, hey, I, I just want you to know, I'm not, I'm not really praying for, like, results here. And he told us that he only gets about four good hours a day, and then he has to shut it down. And I'm thinking, man, he gave one of them to us. He said, the reason I'm here, I want God to know I believe him. Man, those are the moments where you feel like, uh, we came here to try to minister to you, but I think you're encouraging us. You see, what he wanted, to, he wanted to make this statement that he believed God's promises were true, that no matter what happens with his disease, his soul is not anchored in the ocean. It's anchored in the holy of holies, behind the veil, and it can never be moved because it's anchored by Jesus Christ. That God can work all things to good, even if he doesn't know how this ends up. You know, and as you hear that, maybe you feel like I do, like, oh my goodness, I wish I was, oh man, as strong as that guy. Like, that guy's got faith. But you know what? Here's how I think God would approach it with you, because you're not in the same situation that Chris is, and that's okay. But what are you facing today? Where are you discouraged? Where are you encouraged? What's going well? What do you wish was going better? What, what doubts or questions or feelings do you feel like you wrestle with? Where I think Chris and, and I would say, and the writer of Hebrews, but God himself would say to you, trust Jesus to anchor your soul forever. Everything else is a paint can full of cement. Trust Jesus to anchor your soul forever forever. It's because he is the anchor that holds within the veil. Would you pray with me? And then we're going to sing that way together. God, thank you for the promises that you make to us. Lord, there's enough people in this room and in the tent and watching online or, or who knows, Lord, listening to this 10 years from now. Lord, you know where each of our hearts are. And maybe this is just a moment where we need to say for the first time or to be reminded like, like Ray did for me that Jesus Christ and his completed work give me full assurance of hope. Jesus, thank you that you are the anchor that holds within the veil. Amen.
We'll see you next weekend.